Brendan. It's a delight to be back in Dublin and uh, a great honour to be speaking to you at the IIEA um, on the subject of uh, market reform in the water sector. I think, uh, actually, I'm, I feel quite fortuitous to be the last speaker because I think what this demonstrates, um, the, the whole series of presentations that we've seen during the day, is that um, no matter what the challenges are, even if they appear similar or dissimilar, um, you have to take into account the local demographic, you have to take uh, into account the local political economy, and there isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution, and Ireland's very, very uh, fortunate that it can sort of learn from all those different experiences and, and develop solutions that fit its particular local circumstances which I uh, en envy in many ways because of the uh, complexities of the uh, political economy in the UK around the water sector and, and indeed the sort of uh, commercial and environmental challenges that we have on which I will elaborate on now. So, yes, um, you might have seen a flyer which sort of said that I was the Director of Market Reform for the UK Water and Sewage Regulator. But as you can see from this picture, and as you probably heard from Chris uh, a little bit earlier this morning, um, it's a bit more complicated than that. So there's actually a, a separate regulator in um, uh, Scotland, a separate economic regulator, that's Wix, and they also have um, uh, separate consumer bodies and, and, and water quality. Uh, I'm responsible for England and Wales, and even that's getting more complicated now with devolution. And of course, in Northern Ireland, um, you've got uh, separate regulation again. And, and what's also significant is that both in Scotland and Northern Ireland, you still have uh, either a publicly owned wholesale company or a publicly owned uh, authority. You've got a regional uh, government grant funding for, for the water sector. Um, as Chris has told you, you you've got uh, privately owned <coughs> retailers now uh, competing for, for the last three years in Scotland. In England, we've had um, privately owned companies for the better part of 20 years, fully customer funded. And similarly, we have a privately owned uh, company limited by guarantee in Wales. So for a relatively you know, medium-sized jurisdiction, um, there's, got, there's a lot happening just on the sort of regulatory front. Um, but as far as off what's concerned, and also you might um, get a bit confused when you see the literature, we're actually, our full title is the Water Regulatory Services Authority, but we've kept our old name just to avoid the confusion in, in consumers' minds. Um, we are the independent economic regulator of water and sewerage, so uh, I moved from one independent regulator dealing with broadcasting and, uh, and telecommunications um, earlier this year to the water sector. Um, we're constituted as a, as a small non-ministerial government department set up when the companies were privatised in 1989. There's in fact 21 regional um, vertically integrated monopoly companies. <coughs> 10 provide um, both water and sewage services and 11 are water only supply companies. And in those areas, such as uh, Surrey and East Water, you'll actually get two bills. You get one from your water supplier and one from the company, in, in that case Thames Water, who will um, uh, pr pr you pay for the um, sewage treatment. Um, in the UK, there's th over 300,000 kilometres of network and 24 million plus connections. So it's, uh, it's quite sizable. And that's basically the regional outlay of all the um, uh, vertically integrated monopoly companies that there are. Those are the water and sewage companies and those are the water-only companies, and Ofwat's responsible for um, regulating all of those. And some very interesting dynamics and interesting cultures uh, in each of them. Keep this picture in mind, because I'll be talking about the sort of context of the reforms quite a lot around this, so it's quite important to sort of recognize that. Okay, and this is uh, Ofwat. Where are we? Just there, in the, in the wider sort of uh, policy and consumer uh, <coughs> landscape. We've heard a lot today about uh, European legislation, particularly the Water Framework Directive. Um, but we also have um, other agencies in England and Wales. The ones that we deal with the most are obviously the Environment Agency, 
which Giuliano <coughs> has spoken about, that regulates abstraction and discharge and manages flood risk. You've got the Drinking Water Inspectorate, which is again a separate agency that regulates quality standards. We're the economic regulator. You also have the National uh, Natural England and Countryside Council for Wales. You've got consumer advocacy and representation in the form of CC Water. You've obviously got the water and sewerage companies. You've got other utilities, not least the energy companies that provide vital services such as uh, energy that have to be taken into account. You've got your local government. You've got consumers. Um, you've got a, a long supply chain. And you've got raw water users such as other, uh, in the power and agriculture sector. And then, of course, you've got non-governmental organisations and interest groups. Um, so, for example, I'm working on a project to ensure that water is abstracted um, in, in a less environmentally harmful way. And we're working very closely with the World Wide Fund for Nature to develop market-based solutions. And it's wonderful to see uh, a body like WWF realising the potential for markets to help the environment and not sort of beating us around the head as if markets are evil. So, tell you a little bit about the market reform project that I run. Um, if you don't agree about anything else, hopefully you'll agree at the end of it that this job is probably even less of a doddle than um, being one of the members of the uh, European Court of Auditors. <laughs> so, at the moment, and for the, since 1989, the way we've um, regulated um, the water sector in England and Wales is through RPI minus X price controls. So the companies get a, a, a guaranteed um, uh, rate of return for, for their investments. And that's obviously delivered um, some benefits. The other corollary of what we did was we didn't have sort of formal competition in, the term, in terms of entrance, but we did have competition in the sense of benchmarking and, and driving efficiencies through um, the comparison of data from each of the companies and publishing that. And what has that achieved? Well, drinking water uh, c compliance is 99.95% with tough EU standards. Um, we heard from the... Uh, one of our colleagues from the uh, Environment Agency here in, in Ireland that it's, uh, it's a similar figure of something like 98%. Leakage levels are 35% below the peak in the mid-90s. That was a particularly uh, harrowing time for the water sector um, and, and a lot of bad press. 98.6% uh, of bathing water meets EU standards. Bills, we estimate, are about £110 lower than they would otherwise have been in the absence of regulation. And a litre of a tap of water costs less than half a penny. But, uh, as we've heard throughout the whole day, there are real challenges. Um, we're all very familiar with uh, the changing and more extreme climate. Um, we're aware of the rising environmental standards and the needs for climate adaptation within that context. Um, in England, there's population growth, particularly in the southeast uh, of England. And we were talking uh, just now about Israel. Well, I can tell you that um, water availability per capita in London is roughly about the same as Tel Aviv or Damascus, which um, might surprise some people, um, but, but that's a fact. And actually, most of the water is in the southeast is drawn from uh, ground sources. So real, real challenges, real challenges that we have to address. There's obviously issues around affordability, um, which have to be balanced against those for, for the need for, for investment. And there's also rising consumer expectations. Um, in, in the United Kingdom, there is a, a long history of privatization, uh, of regulation, and in some areas, greater success to a move to competition, notably in telecommunications, to a certain degree in, in energy and other sectors. And certainly that applies to businesses who have uh, an expectation of service, which quite frankly does not exist um, from the water companies in England and Wales at the moment. Perhaps we can learn from Veolia in France. Okay, so given all those challenges, what are we trying to achieve? What am I trying to achieve when developing market-based reforms in, in England and Wales? Well, clearly um, one of the key areas is sustainable water a sustainable water cycle in which we are able to meet our needs for water and sewerage while allowing future generations to meet their own needs. 
It's not just about the here and now and the short term. This is a, a long term sector anyway. Um, planning scales often uh, um, have lead times of 15, 20, 30 years plus. And we believe that we can achieve some of this through sustainable market reform, developing markets which support customers, um, continuing to receive a safe and reliable supply, but making sure that they receive those um, services um, as they want and at the best prices. We want to make sure from an environmental point of view that there is efficient use of resources and reducing the need for carbon intensive solutions. And new commercial opportunities for companies, including the potential for water resource trading, returns to innovation and allowing for greater consolidation in the sector. So why markets? Well, I've listed what the challenges are, and I think all of them um, have the themes of being uh, leading to greater uncertainty and unpredictability, which is exactly the sorts of things that investors do not like, um, particularly if they're investing in, in a sector like water. But markets can bring um, benefits to that uncertainty and unpredictability, which simply cannot be achieved through second best solutions um, by the re regulator. Pierre, I think, uh, summed it up very nicely by saying, why do you have economic regulation? You have economic regulation to try and mimic markets. So surely the next logical step is to actually try and bring about those markets rather than continuing to try and mimic it, given all this unpredictability and uncertainty. Markets can reveal new information. You can allocate uh, scarce resources more efficiently. You can uh, have innovation and experimentation. You can be more responsive to customers. And there's flexible processes to suit uh, to responding uh, uncertainty. Now, there is a lot to cover because that's all the sort of areas that I have to deal with in one way or another when looking at identifying market mechanisms as potential solutions, right from abstractions through to wholesale to the retail value chain, and then given the particular nature of treatment of, of sewerage and, and surface water drainage, there is a sort of a parallel stream, if you like, around sludge, uh, wholesale wastewater and retail wastewater, um, but, but given the, where we are in the time, uh, and I knew I wouldn't have much time to speak, I'm just going to focus today to give you a sort of a flavour of, of um, the solutions that we're developing around the wholesale water supply and the retail water supply. I'll obviously try and answer other questions um, um, when we get to that stage. Now, there have been attempts at trying to um, introduce competition already under the Water Act in 2003 um, through the um, water supply licensing uh, uh, regime, WSL as it's called, and also something called NAVs, New Appointments and Variations. But unfortunately, um, they haven't been successful. So just as Chris was uh, very honest in his presentation, I'm being very honest with you now. It was retail only. It was supplied to very large users. The threshold at that point was 50 megalitres. Now, if you're a water industry expert, you immediately know how much 50 megalitres is. If you're not, it's um, 50,000 um, cubed metres of water, which is equivalent to about 20 uh, Olympic swimming pools. Um, the only, uh, only incumbents had the marginal cost savings rebated through the legislation, through something called the cost principle, which meant that the costs had to be covered. So it meant that an equally efficient entrant couldn't really compete with that. Um, the combined water supply license, which uh, meant that you could pr uh, also provide the water, meant that you had to match the water input to the retail offtake made by the customer, was seldom practical. So in the end, what actually happened was that um, there, there has been very little competition. In fact, I think it's only seven Trent um, supplies to, to one major business customer in their region. So it's been a failure. It's been a failure, uh, the, the way it was designed. Um, again, uh, new, new entrants and variations. Entrants were given a franchise for retail and network activities in a designated area. Um, to facilitate bulk supply from the incumbent. It was limited to unserved areas, um, but it was based uh, on, on agreement from the incumbent to give up particular territory in order to facilitate that within their region. 
Um, there was opportunity to sell them bulk supply through water efficiency, etc. But again, not particularly um, significant, although there is, there is greater promise if we can reduce the regulatory barriers around that too. So this has been the sort of uh, policy and regulatory journey so far on trying to bring about greater competition in the water sector. We had off what started with our review of competition in response to a lack of activity under that complex regime, which I, I've sort of tried to get through very quickly, and it is very complex. Um, there was an internal review in 2006-07, an external uh, review with consultation 07-08. Um, then the government commissioned Professor Martin Cave, who's currently at the London School of Economics, to see um, what could be done to improve things. Um, DEFRA, the uh, Department for uh, Environment, uh, uh, Fisheries and Rural Affairs, had a consultation on, on that CAVE report. Um, needless to say, companies weren't particularly keen on, on the uh, competitive aspects, nor did they like some of the suggestions that there should be a legal separation akin to the reforms that had taken place in Scotland between uh, the wholesale and the retail parts. Um, we ourselves introduced um, elements of accounting separation, which again will be familiar to people who uh, uh, dealt with reforms in the telecoms and energy sectors. We had the first pilots in 2008 and 2009. At the moment, um, my colleague Chris Eslin Peart is leading on something called Future Price Limits, who is trying to see how we can better incentivize and re ring fence different parts of the value chain. Um, through um, the powers that we have currently around price controls and also to reduce the burden on, on companies. Because um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in order to um, set the price controls, um, the process over 20 years has re resulted in, in ever greater requirements for data. Again, this goes back to, to, to Chris's point. So I think when the price control started in 1989, I think there was about uh, 71 different lines of data that a water company had to provide to uh, Ofwat for the price control. At the last one, before we started um, reducing um, the information requirements as part of our reforms, I think it stood at about 1,600 lines. And the commentaries on that um, went into 900 pages, and that's per company. Okay? So a huge regulatory burden, and you sort of think to yourself, can you really continue with, with that sort of regime going forward, given all the uncertainty and unpredictability and the changes we face? The government, at the end of October, announced the drop to um, five uh, megalitres for companies um, who qualify to be able to switch supplier. So I was telling you about the 50 megalitre limit. That's 20 Olympic swimming pools. Well, now that's down to uh, two, two um, Olympic-sized swimming pools. And we hope that one day it will be zero, so that even small and, and medium-sized enterprises will also be able to um, switch a retail provider. There are no plans to extend competition to um, domestic household customers, however, in, in England and Wales. Um, certainly not before I retire, um, which is still a while away, I'm, I'm glad to say. Um, and then, of course, the biggie is, of course, the government's white paper, which we're expecting any time soon after a great deal of delay. And that will be drawing on all the different independent reports, including uh, Martin Cave's. And we'll see just how brave ministers will be <coughs> in terms of the, the recommendations that they um, take on board. So a lot of my work will be about implementing that. So I was very uh, uh, interested to hear what your minister had to say, because I, I know exactly how it feels. Because our minister gave, gave a speech at a water conference a few weeks ago, and it was the, the lightest on content I've ever heard, because, of course, he was tight-lipped as well, uh, what he could say. Okay, so um, just very quickly, um, so these are the sort of practical steps that we're, we're taking it off for at the moment. First of all, we'll go and look at retail markets and then go to wholesale. I think the um, slides have been printed out anyway, so you've got this information. Um, we want to obviously create an effective retail market offering choice to all non-household customers. Um, and we want to introduce a retail competition for businesses that would help. How are we going to do that? Well, that depends largely on the, on the government legislation. As I said to you, Martin Cave wanted to introduce some form of legal separation. That's now looking unlikely, 
but there's still a great deal you can do in terms of issuing separate licenses for wholesale and retail services. And it's quite important to, to have this sort of competition because it just drives a focus on, on customer care. At the moment, if you're a multi-sited business customer in, in, in uh, England, you cannot get a single bill for water. You're lucky if you can get um, your bill electronically. Some of these companies, believe it or not, are still sending paper bills to, to um, large corporations. And they're not doing much in terms of trying to help with the demand management side of things either. So there's, there's certainly scope for, for um, improved service there. And despite the fact that Business Stream has about 90% market share after three years in Scotland, um, uh, every major business customer that you speak to, such as Scottish Procurement, will say that they've seen the tangible benefits in terms of customer care, levels of service, and, and the deals that they've been able to strike um, in, in Scotland following the introduction of retail competition in their jurisdiction. Um, yep, so I'm not going to dwell on this because we haven't got much time. Um, I've just sort of covered mo most of that. In terms of structures, if you can imagine the value chain of water being from resources and abstraction through to treatment, through network distribution um, to retail, the sort of issues that we will now have to deal with in order to make sure that it works certainly from an entrance perspective, is to make sure that they have sufficient margin to compete with um, existing uh, vertically integrated uh, companies. So we have to look at access prices at the wholesale end. Um, we also need to also look at the, the default tariff. I should actually say tariffs, because obviously existing business customers will have certain prices, but they will want to move to, to more attractive offers once competition <laughs> takes place. And also, what's important is that um, you look at the sort of horizontal as well as the vertical chain in all of this, because what you don't want to do is for ordinary household customers to suffer as a result of competition for, for um, non-household customers. What you don't want companies to do is to start loading all the costs onto domestic consumers as they try and cherry-pick and compete for, for the business consumers. So all of these things are being currently looked at uh, at Offward. Um, another big area that my team is uh, leading on is developing codes and agreements. Because if you are going to be a new entrant uh, uh, in England and Wales, what you don't want to do is have to negotiate with 22 different regional companies. So we're trying to develop um, common codes and contracts so that it's very easy to uh, enter the, the marketplace. So there will be market codes, operational codes. There'll obviously have to be a, a, an integrated um, switching system as well to make sure that that is very smooth. Turning to wholesale markets, um, I think uh, actually what Giuliano said about water trading on Australia is, is quite sort of relevant to what we're trying to do as well. Um, because we believe, again, that markets can help allocate scarce water resources in, in the most efficient way. Um, and they can reduce environmental risks. Um, if you have water trading between different regions, um, you actually increase security of supply. You don't threaten it because you actually encourage interconnection between companies. Um, it enables new entrants to stimulate I innovation. So, for example, instead of thinking, right, I get a regulated return, so I'm going to build some plants in my area, you might think, actually, it might be more efficient to buy water from my neighbour in order to meet my needs. And even under the existing regime, there, there are actually about nine different contracts in England that already facilitate water, bulk water trading. Some of it is actually in tankers when, when they need it, but others actually are pipes that go from one region to another. And what's actually interesting is that within the water companies, um, such as in, in, in Yorkshire, they have very sophisticated interconnection arrangements within the region. So what we're really tr just trying to do by introducing um, wholesale trading is to extend that interconnection, which is within small uh, regions of the water companies, across regions. And in terms of water scarcity and developments and costs, well, I think that gives you a pretty good idea. Do you remember what I was saying to you about the sort of demands for water in the southeast of England? Well, if you look at this map, um, blue is where water is available, yellow, no water available, 
Orange is over-licensed abstraction, red is just over-abstracted licensed area, and grey is where there's only groundwater only, there's no other sources of water. So quite, quite a challenge, and not only in the southeast, but actually in sort of major urban conurbations uh, elsewhere in, in England and Wales. And that's what we're trying to uh, um, address. And increasingly, um, we're not doing this on our own. One of the uh, recommendations from another independent review that the government commissioned was that there should be greater cooperation between us and the other regulatory agencies. So the Environment Agency, who I've uh, sourced these diagrams from, they will actually have a memorandum of understanding with us and we're working on quite a lot of projects together to, to see how we can more effectively manage water resource management. So it's, 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 it's a very exciting time, actually, in England and Wales. Um, OK, so the wholesale water market, the current situation, as I said, there's 21 appointed water companies. 4.5% of water is traded in bulk supplies. Those are the nine contracts that I was telling you about. Most bulk supplies, 82% by volume, are these old agreements and predate even privatisation. And about 10% of water is brought from outside appointed water company areas using their own assets. Um, as I said, there was this water supply license, um, but as I also said, there hasn't been a great many instances of this happening. So we're hoping that the next stage of reforms will really kickstart um, this market. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to create upstream-only licenses. The government will have to uh, legislate for that to happen, and that's what we're hoping will appear in the white paper. Um, water trading will include the establishment of a, a model bulk supply contract. We will implement various incentives through things such as uh, the price to beat. We will produce a, a non-bulk price uh, supply guidance to complement the existing pricing guidance that exists. We will try to remove restrictive access pricing regime from law. Um, we will extend assets to which access can be granted from pipes to include treatment works and reservoirs. And possibly, as part of the um, future price limits project that I was telling you about, we're going to consider separate price caps for resources for what we call network plus the distribution bits, the pipe works plus the treatment works, and separate price caps for retail. So all in all, um, I've got a busy year ahead of me. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.